and Northrop Grumman Antares rocket launched a Cygnus cargo spacecraft on August 10, carrying more than 3,700 kilograms of cargo for the International Space Station. The mission Antares was carrying was the 16th Commercial Resupply Services mission for the Cygnus spacecraft. Named SS Ellison on Azuka, the spacecraft carried a multitude of experiments, including studies over engineered muscle tissue, slime molds, and a 3D printing demonstration using simulated regal. The single-cell slime mold, nicknamed Blob, will be the subject of an educational experiment organized by French astronaut Thomas Pesquet. NASA sent two different payloads that will look at human muscle cells in space to develop treatments for muscle-related diseases. The company Redwire sent a 3D printer to the station that will print three different slabs of lunar regolith which will eventually be returned to Earth for analysis. There is also a four-bed CO2 scrubber demonstration that NASA says is based on the existing ISS system. NASA is also sending up the flow boiling and condensation experiment to conduct a variety of experiments to better understand flow boiling and condensation in microgravity conditions. As part of an investigation called the Kentucky Reentry Probe Experiment, researchers from the University of Kentucky are testing out new thermal protection materials. The Cygnus spacecraft is carrying three capsules each with different thermal protection materials, with a variety of sensors placed within the heat shield for data collection. As the Cygnus capsule plummets through the atmosphere during its return trip, the special capsules will release from the spacecraft and splash down in the Atlantic Ocean. The thermal response data obtained during entry will determine how efficient each material was. After a 36-hour journey, the cargo ship arrived at the International Space Station on Thursday, August 12. Safely in the grip of Canadarm2, Cygnus was attached to the nadir port of the Unity module for the multi-month cargo delivery and removal process. The spacecraft is expected to remain docked at the space station till late November. At the conclusion of its mission, the spacecraft is slated to be unberthed from the outpost to deorbit and burn up in Earth's atmosphere. A recent report suggests that NASA's development of new spacesuits will be nearly two years late and nicks its effort to land humans on the moon by 2024. The new Artemis-tailored spacesuit, known as the Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit, was unveiled in 2019. According to NASA, this advanced spacesuit offers increased mobility and redesigned communication systems compared to the Apollo-era lunar suits. The suits also have a variable pressure system to give astronauts more flexibility when they need it. In an August 10 report, NASA's Office of Inspector General said this next-generation suit won't be ready for flight until at least April 2025 and may be subject to further delays. The report identified several factors for the delay, such as technical issues, funding shortfalls, and impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. NASA has already spent $420 million on spacesuit development since 2007, and it plans to invest approximately $625 million more. The report made four recommendations for NASA, from extending the schedule of suit development and making sure the suits can also be used on the ISS to finalizing an acquisition strategy. Meanwhile, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk offered SpaceX's services to help NASA make its next-generation spacesuits. Even though NASA astronauts had flown on SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft wearing SpaceX-designed flight suits, it's unclear whether SpaceX has an active spacesuit development program. SpaceX flight suits are only designed for zero-gravity environments in a craft, and they have to completely redesign their suits to operate on the lunar surfaces. As it turns out, SpaceX is already one of around two dozen interested parties active in NASA's Exploration Extravehicular Activity Services program. Interested parties will have until mid-October to submit proposals to design and build modern EVA spacesuits capable of supporting astronauts on the lunar surface and spacewalks in Earth orbit. In last week's updates, we have discussed the delay of the Starliner mission to the International Space Station and the failed attempt of Perseverance to collect Martian samples. We now have some updates about both of these issues. The launch attempt of the Boeing Starliner spacecraft was scrubbed on August 3, after engineers noticed a group of fuel valves in the Starliner's propulsion section wasn't positioned as programmed. According to an August 13 press release from Boeing, the Starliner capsule won't be launching to the space station until it's gone through deeper level troubleshooting to fix an issue with four propulsion system valves that remain closed after the scrubbed launch. That troubleshooting means removing the capsule from the Atlas V rocket it's been coupled to and bringing it back to Boeing's facility. According to Boeing, the leading cause of the valve problem is that the nitrogen tetroxide oxidizer used for Starliner's thrusters interacted with moisture on the dry side of the valve, creating nitric acid. The acid corroded the valves, causing them to stick in the closed position. Boeing is not certain where the moisture came from, but suggests that it could have happened during assembly of the spacecraft in the factory or exposure to humid conditions on the pad just before launch. 
The company said it had fixed nine of the 13 valves after the application of electrical and thermal techniques to open them, but four other valves remained closed and were still being worked on. Boeing concluded that they will continue to work on the issue from the Starliner factory and have decided to stand down for this launch window to make way for other national priority missions. Recently, NASA released a statement explaining why the Perseverance rover failed to collect any rock samples from Mars during its maiden sample collection attempt on August 6. After investigating the issue, Perseverance team declared that this particular Martian rock was too powdery to be successfully collected. The science and engineering teams working on the mission found that the uniqueness of this rock at this sampling site is the dominant contributor to the difficulty in extracting a core from it. In short, the hardware performed as commanded, but the rock did not cooperate this time. The next sample collection attempt is scheduled for early September. An Indian geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle suffered a catastrophic failure shortly after launching on August 12. The GSLV F-10 mission lifted off from the Satish Dhawan Space Center on Tuesday, carrying an Earth imaging satellite for ISRO. Earth Observation Satellite EOS-03 is a synthetic aperture radar-based Earth imaging satellite built for tasks pertaining to forestry, agricultural, and disaster management. The initial phases of the flight appeared to go as planned, as did the separation of the rocket's payload fairing. Four minutes and 55 seconds after liftoff, the second stage separated, with the upper stage's cryogenic engine scheduled to ignite one second later. The stage appeared to start to roll and lose attitude control moments later based on animations derived from launch vehicle telemetry. At one point, telemetry screens showed the stage losing altitude and velocity, while the animation showed the stage had clearly lost attitude control. Minutes of silence followed on the webcast before ISRO confirmed that the launch had failed. According to ISRO, the cryogenic upper stage ignition did not happen as planned due to a technical anomaly failing the mission. The launch was the 14th flight of the GSLV, India's largest launch vehicle, and the 8th of the Mark II version, which is an upper stage with a domestically developed cryogenic engine. This is the first launch failure for ISRO since 2017, after a run of 14 consecutive successful launches. ISRO is expected to perform another GSLV Mark II launch later this year, with several more to follow in 2022 and 23. Now, let us discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Nearly two weeks ago, SpaceX stacked a Starship and Super Heavy test vehicle for the first time on for a fit check test. Later the ship was unstacked from the booster and sent back to the build site for pre-flight preparations. For unknown reasons, perhaps due to high winds, Booster 4 spent another five days at the pad before SpaceX lifted it off the orbital launch mount and rolled it back to the high bay. Almost immediately after Ship 20's August 6 return, its six Raptor engines were removed to make way for an engine-less proof test campaign. Mirroring Ship 20, SpaceX began uninstalling Booster 4's 29 Raptor engines the same day it returned to the high bay and completed the process the next day. Elon Musk stated that SpaceX is working to complete some small plumbing and wiring on the launch vehicles, which is easier inside the high bay. Aside from Raptor removal, workers thoroughly inspected Ship 20's heat shield for repairing or replacing broken and loose tiles. Workers marked the ship's nose heat shield with colored tape to isolate the tiles with cracks or other less visible issues. After several days of inspections and hundreds of tiles marked, SpaceX technicians seemingly managed to remove several dozens of broken tiles in a few hours. On Friday, August 13, after completing works inside the high bay, SpaceX rolled out Ship 20 to the launch site. Cameras were seen installed on the vehicle to shoot onboard visuals during the orbital test flight of the vehicle. Meanwhile, Booster 4 is currently undergoing minor final integration work inside the high bay. According to Musk, Booster 4 will be taken back to the launch site as soon as Monday, August 14. Once ready, the vehicles will go through a set of ground tests in separate test campaigns. Each vehicle will undergo cryogenic proof testing to assess its strength. If all goes well, SpaceX will reinstall the engines into the vehicles to perform static fire tests. SpaceX recently applied to the Federal Communications Commission for a special temporary authority to operate Starlink during ground testing of Starship prototype orbital test vehicle communications. The requested operational period starts on September 16, suggesting that we could see a Starship fly to orbit as soon as next month if the company receives regulatory approval from all federal agencies, including an environmental review from the Federal Aviation Administration. Moreover, recently Musk tweeted that the first orbital stack of Starship will fly in a few weeks, once the pending regulatory approvals are granted. In the meantime, SpaceX will complete the rest of the work on the tank farm and orbital launch site and will also install a quick disconnect mechanism in the launch tower. Work on the quick disconnect arm that connects power and fuel lines to the rocket before launch is in progress at the launch site. 
SpaceX is also working to install the booster catching arm to the launch tower, although it is not necessary for the first orbital flight test. According to Musk, the catching arm will be installed soon, and the arm will be fully operational before the second orbital flight test of the Starship. He added that SpaceX plans to capture the Starship with the launch tower so that it does not need a landing leg to land on Earth. The Government Accountability Office recently released its 76-page review and denial of the protests from Blue Origin and Dynetics over NASA's decision to select SpaceX as the sole human landing system contractor. The protest was denied on July 30, and the newly released GAO document notes that SpaceX performed better in the areas of technology and management compared to the Blue Origin and Dynetics. Moreover, the report mentions that SpaceX requires 16 Starship launches to allow a single spacecraft to have enough fuel to send astronauts to the moon. But according to Elon Musk, 16 flights and docking in orbit is not a problem for SpaceX because they did more than 16 orbital flights in the first half of 2021 and have docked with the International Space Station over 20 times. He added that 16 flights are extremely unlikely because the Starship payload to orbit is approximately 150 tons, so only a maximum of 8 flights are required to fill the 1,200-ton tanks of Lunar Starship. Also, without flaps and heat shield, Lunar Starship is much lighter, so they may only need half full tanks for lunar trips, requiring only four tanker flights. Meanwhile, Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin is continuing its protest through its official website against SpaceX's contract win. A week after posting an infographic on its website saying Starship is complex and risky, Blue Origin now updated their comments by posting an infographic titled, This is what immense complexity and heightened risk looks like for going back to the moon with SpaceX. According to Blue Origin, SpaceX's Texas spaceport, Starbase, doesn't exist, and each Starship orbital refueling mission launch takes 12 days turnaround. But according to Musk, Starship Super Heavy is designed for reflight in less than an hour. Furthermore, Blue Origin stated that they stand by their assessment that SpaceX received preferential treatment from NASA. In response, Musk hit back at the company and tweeted an old picture of the company's moon lander, which appeared to be slightly deflated in the middle. Sharing the picture, the Tesla CEO wrote, somehow, this wasn't convincing. He added that, if lobbying and lawyers could Jeff Bezos to space orbit, he probably would be sitting in Pluto right now. He stated that, even if Santa Claus suddenly made Blue Origin's hardware real for free, the first thing you'd want to do is cancel it. Meanwhile, NASA recently paid $300 million to SpaceX under the HLS program towards Starship. Responding to a tweet mentioning the recent payment, Musk replied that the lunar starship will probably be ready to land humans on the moon sooner than 2024. In an interview with YouTube creator Tim Dodd, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has opened up about some new starship updates. Musk said that SpaceX has decided to almost entirely remove any recognizable separation mechanism from the Starship Super Heavy launch vehicle. Usually, in rocketry, an actuating latch or frangible bolts are used to attach and detach the core stage and the upper stage of a launch vehicle. Musk says that Starship will have no such separation mechanism because at some point during the designer testing process, SpaceX decided that a separation mechanism was entirely redundant and that the same effect could be more or less replicated by using existing systems on Super Heavy. By using the booster's gimballing Raptor engines to impart a small but significant rotation on the rocket moments before separation, Super Heavy could effectively flick Starship away from it thanks to inertia and centripetal forces. This is a bit like how SpaceX currently deploys Starlink satellites from Falcon 9 by spinning the upper stage end over end and letting the spacecraft just float away. In addition to this, SpaceX has decided to remove the dedicated hot gas thrusters from Super Heavy. To replace it, SpaceX will use the ullage gas from the tanks for attitude control by having four vents spaced 90 degrees apart. Moreover, SpaceX is now planning for a side-by-side -side orbital refueling, contrary to the butt-to-butt -butt refueling idea. This is because recently the Starship was redesigned to shift the propellant drain line's location to the side. Moving on to other Starship updates, parts of the Super Heavy Booster 5 were spotted at the build site last week. The common dome and a forward tank stainless steel section were found lying near the high bay. Part of Booster 5's downcomer was also spotted arriving at the build site on flatbed trucks. On Saturday, Booster 3, the first super heavy booster to have conducted a static fire test, has been scrapped in situ at the suborbital pad. A newly built ground support equipment tank was moved to the launch site on August 11. One of the GSE tanks at the launch site got sleeved with a cryo shell the same day. The cryo shell will enclose the GSE tanks, allowing the company to fill the gap between them with an insulating material. The tank farm now consists of one water tank, one methane tank, and four GSE tanks, out of which two were sleeved. 
Work on the orbital launch tower is progressing, and workers have begun removing the tower platforms. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.